Okay, let's begin. I feel a little bit like uh, in a church. Uh, so this is not, I'm not going to start preaching, but I want to, of course, give a little bit of context. Before I do that, I have to thank some people uh, who deserve thanks. Uh, so I'm welcoming you in the name of the history department uh, that gave some of the money for this uh, uh, glorious occasion. And then, of course, our very own uh, research priority area, Uses of the Past, that has funded most of it. And we are very proud. <coughs> I'm relating uh, uh, apologies from, uh, from our director of our research area, Jan Iverson. He cannot be here today. He has very important university business to attend to in China. Uh, but he sends his regards. And of course, we have fantastic uh, replacement because I just see that Niels has arrived, uh, the, uh, the, chef, the chef, the boss of the history department. So that we are, we are in that sense, uh, complete. Uh, I, of course, also want to thank uh, our participants of the panel today of our conversation that we will um, attempt to, um, to undertake for your entertainment and education. Uh, there is Cecilia Banke. You know her very well, I'm sure, as a Danish participant and from the media. There's also Tina Marina from Amsterdam, also an expert in uh, memory culture. And then, of course, our esteemed guest, uh, Saul Friedlander, uh, all the way from Los Angeles. Although I should add that this is possible because of the generous financial support from people who organized a big Holocaust conference in Berlin just a few days ago. And we piggybacked on, on that event, which uh, we are both agree was a very impressive uh, conference, honoring the uh, famous Holocaust historian Raoul Hilberg, who died uh, 10 years ago. Now, that's to the thanks. One thank I shouldn't forget. I really want to thank uh, Anne Breuer, uh, who organized the whole thing, and this would be completely impossible without her help. Thank you very much. You. Now, what I want to do now is to give you a little bit of context, because I assume none of you have really read the books. And, and since I have, this is, this is just a part of them, right? This is part on this part here and this part here. So, uh, in a sense, you haven't read them. There are too many of them anyway, and uh, that is one explanation. But I do want to provide some background. I want to give a framing for our conversation. We will take our point of departure from the memoirs that Saul Friedlander has written, two memoirs written 40 plus years apart. That will be our point of departure, and I'll return to them uh, in a minute. But I do want to first provide also some background information about a very long uh, career in, yeah, historical studies, although one can say you are not really trained as a historian. No. Share that with Raoul Hilberg. You're more of a political scientist. That might explain some of the features of uh, that career. Because I, and in the last uh, weeks, I had, I had this stack of books uh, next to my couch. And whenever I had a moment between you know, doing serious work, uh, taking care of my children. I picked up the book and read a paragraph here, a paragraph there, and maybe also a chapter. And uh, there's a couple of uh, insights one can easily glean from that kind of uh, exercise. That, first of all, it is the length of the career that I think is impressive. Because your first book, 1964, right? Uh, on uh, Pius, Pope Pius. No, 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 no. Not the first. Historically book. false. The first is, is 19, the end of yes. 1963, my dissertation, which okay. became a book. I stand, I stand corrected, but of course, as a book, it was published a few years afterwards. Could that be? In English, but not yes. in French. Ah, yeah, good. <laughs> I looked at the English titles. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, see? Uh, maybe, maybe a historian after all. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so the first one that I took notice of uh, in my, with my very uh, inaccurate sources was the book published in 1964 about Pope Pius XII and Nazi Germany, which became uh, a stunning success uh, because it spoke to serious questions at a time. And the moral question was, why did the Vatican, and more specifically the Pope, remain silent despite the fact that the Vatican and the Pope had very specific information about the Holocaust early on. And this question that was raised by a number of publications and public events at the time, in a sense, you provided an answer. And if I'm, if I'm now hopefully correct, your answer was the Pope, in essence, the Pope wasn't anti-Semitic, but um, the Pope 
was very concerned about communism. And being very concerned about communism, he identified National Socialism as, so to speak, the force that could contain communism. And hence, he remained silent. This is a, a one-way, you know, one-line summary of a book. See? Another book you don't have to read. Um, so this is one of the, this is one of the, uh, uh, this is the first book uh, that made already uh, t uh, tremendous waves and made, made the cover of the Spiegel magazine, for example, in Germany and the cover of many other magazines in other, in other countries as well. So that, w that was one of the first, but then there was many, of course, to come. Then in English, the dissertation about another diplomatic topic, uh, the United States uh, and Hitler. Then, uh, and I'm being very selective here, I'm not taking every title, that would take too long. Then, but very, very interesting book about Kurt Gerstein, the, uh, the Ambivalence of Good, I think is the English title, if I remember correctly. But the second, one of the next insights one, one uh, walks away with from, from that uh, reading is not just the length of the career that lasts from the 1960s all the way to the present, all the way to now, but also a career that is extremely diverse in terms of theoretical approach, theoretical curiosity, and methodology. So you started out more or less as a diplomatic historian or political scientist with a lot of interest in diplomatic history, and that's the point of departure. But on many, <coughs> on many moments, there are important publications, path-breaking publications, that take a completely different angle. I briefly mentioned a book on uh, history and psychoanalysis uh, in the 1950s, in the 1970s, but I do want to highlight maybe the book that was most important to me and that is still my secret uh, favorite. It's Reflections of Nazism, um, published in French. 82. Yeah. Good. 82. <laughs> I think in English for the first time in uh, 84. And what I personally always appreciated about this book, and I, I, I think it's still highly recommendable reading, that is the visual literacy of a, histori of a historian. I think that, that it's quite, quite rare. It, it taught me to take the content of the form of visual media very seriously, because, because the book it uh, deals with examples, very popular, important examples of visual culture in the 1970s that in, a, in, a f in an intriguing but also in a very, very disturbing way reflect, uh, reflect Nazi culture. And so that, that, the, that the visual culture of the 1980s already um, engages with a fascination of Nazism that we are maybe more familiar with today that is both intriguing also often educational, but also deeply disturbing because it doubles, it uh, repeats an aesthetic gesture of, of Nazi culture. And that, that was for me, because I deal often with television, an absolutely um, important uh, book. Then of course there were many other uh, important uh, books to come. Another one that for me has been important because I was on the sidelines involved in its production, is Probing the Limits of Representation, which to this date I would argue is still the most serious engagement with the theories of Hayden White by an empirical historian. Um, and it's still, and, and this is, I should add another note, what, what one recognizes when you trace these publications online, um, the majority of them are still in print. So here are books, uh, the Pope book, for example, is still in print in German. Uh, Probing the Limits from 1992 is still in print. The majority of the books are still in print. But we haven't even reached uh, the highlight, uh, in many ways, uh, of a long and productive career. At an age when other scholars uh, retire, Rafid, um, uh, you published uh, what probably most people would uh, consider your most important book, uh, that is here, yeah, The Years of Extermination, the second volume of a synthetic history of Nazi Germany and the Jews. The first one is also here. The first deals with the years 1939, um, not 1933 to 1939, and the second with the years of 1939 to 1945. By the way, this is, this is how a book looks like that you have actually, that you read closely, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, uh, that book um, is changed the discipline. I, I think one can see it. We, again, we were at the Holocaust Conference in Berlin now, and uh, the discipline of Holocaust studies speaks before and after years of extermination. 
what was the game changer? The game changer was that more or less before uh, the publication of Years of Extermination, in 2007, at the age of 75, before that, Holocaust studies was more or less always focused on the perspective of the perpetrators. The perpetrators, in terms of the research of causality, had left behind the most important sources, and historians uh, published, worked on many different source material. They worked also on source material from Eastern Europe after the uh, wall fell. But the, the perspective uh, remained a perspective that worked the, its way into the intricacies of Holocaust history with the documents and from the perspective of the perpetrators. And um, Years of Extermination changed that because Year of Extermination is multi-perspectival in the sense that the perspective of the perpetrators is at least as important as the, uh, the perspective of the victims. So now, for the first time in any synthetic text of Holocaust history, the voices of the victims come to the forefront. And that, that decisive change, that decisive ethical decision changed the discipline. So today, when any kind of uh, larger projects about Holocaust history are launched, they are including that aspect of multi-perspectivity. We heard, for example, in Berlin that uh, in Germany right now, they're in the process of finishing a very, very large um, project about sources of Nazi Germany, sources of Holocaust history. And it absolutely goes without saying that the conceptual blueprint for that source collection is the multi-directional approach that uh, you have uh, spearheaded. So um, that is gives you already a sense of the importance for historical studies. But again, I, I want to, to highlight another, the breadth and, and intellectual curiosity, because uh, I think now, how many years ago? Four years ago, you published a book on Kafka, uh, for example. And that brings us perhaps back to an another approach to history, another approach of writing and brings us back uh, to the memoirs. The two memoirs, the one uh, When Memory Comes, um, published in French in 1979. Eight, then eight. 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 Oh, thank you. And then what's, when is the first English edition? Probably Sorry. 79. No. Yeah, Probably. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, of course, the the second volume published in 2016 already in the States? <laughs> <No. laughs> I don't know, I think 16, yes. 16. Where memory leads. So this is the wider part, and as you will see now, because that's going to be our point of departure, very, very different books, very different narrative uh, universes, I would argue. Um, the when memory comes is has a complicated time structure. It works on at least three different time levels at the same time. It's a very it in that sense has literary ambition in terms of the construction of time. I think where memory leads is a very direct book. It's chronologically, it's seemingly easily flowing, uh, but of course highly uh, constructed as well. But both books, despite their very different structure are books that are page turners. And I find that was one of the experiences I had now reading them, reading uh, them again. I had read both of them before I prepared for this event. And I'm, I think I have an explanation for the page turning qualities of uh, When Memory Comes. Because Memory Comes has this, the point of gravity, uh, the tragic event of your parents' death, and that is, is masterfully worked into a, into a narrative that provides one element of suspense, just one element of suspense, but it provides a, a clear focal point. I have, uh, to this moment, to this moment, I'm not quite sure what the page turning explanation is of the rhetorics of where memory leads, because I, for one, uh, knew a great deal of the story, but I found myself reading it very quickly, very eagerly, um, all the way to the end, very also in one setting, um, which is uh, a luxury we don't have very often. So maybe we can even talk about that. You know, we can start talking about the quality of that, uh, of that writing. And then, of course, sometimes it's not the writer who has the explanations, right? We'll, we'll find out. Um, last work, of course, is in this career with this breadth, uh, with this length, uh, there came uh, a number of uh, prizes. I can't think of another historian uh, with that kind of number and, 
and, and, and high um, prestige prizes. I want to mention the Geschwister Scholl Prize in Germany, MacArthur Fellowship, uh, the so-called Genius Grant, uh, very appropriate. Uh, the Peace Prize of the uh, German Book Trade, which has a little awkward name, but is the single most important prize in Germany, and the uh, Pulitzer Prize. And this is just, again, uh, a very short uh, cross-section of the prizes. Good. That gives you perhaps some orientation that we are in an interesting, you know, this should be interesting. And uh, we'll start with talking about uh, the books, and I'll, I'll switch now and sit down here. With hopefully also that works for the camera. Uh, yeah, where do we begin? Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when you write memoirs, you have something memorable to tell. And the memorable could be something, f one thing for the audience and one thing for the author. In those two books, what was, what's the memorability of the books? What's your focus? What, what is, so to speak, the, the essence that you felt you wanted to communicate? And you write in those books that it's, it was tricky to find a voice uh, when, m when memory comes. It, was, it took you a while to find an approach. Maybe it had just to do with a question of memorability, of finding that, that anchor point, that strategy that works. So, so what was the, you know, what's the, what's the memory, since this is all about users of the past, what is the memory you wanted to, to give us? Well, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for uh, for your introduction, I mean, it's much too generous. Uh, you know the difference between this kind of introduction and a eulogy. <laughs> yes, in I hope. this kind of introduction, <laughs> one person believes in what is being said, and in a eulogy, nobody believes. <laughs> <laughs> now, the question is, who's the one person who believed it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I tried for many years to tell the story uh, which is finally told in uh, uh, When Memory Comes, that is the story of my childhood. Yep. It's not that I had any plan or any uh, intention, uh, any theoretical intention, no, in any case I didn't have. I felt the need somehow <laughs> to tell it, but couldn't. What is the it? The story. The story. The story. Where do you think, what, is, what do you think is the focal point of the story? <laughs> the focal point of the story is the events uh, that led me from a normal uh, Jewish assimilated oh. family in Prague to France, first of all, which you can hear a little bit in my accent, I guess and from uh, France, that is from Paris, to the center of France, and from the center of France to a Catholic uh, boarding school, uh, seminary, uh, to the loss of my parents, who were killed by the Germans, and then uh, to my being a Catholic, a very devoted Catholic, and then getting back to some kind of semi-normalcy, and finally, deciding to run away from the high school where I was in Paris to Palestine, mm -hmm. well, which just had become Israel in uh, 1948. I arrived a few weeks after the creation of the state. Uh, so what is memorable, I don't know, but many of those things are yeah. pretty memorable, not only for me, but for many, mm -hmm. uh, that is, it's not a unique story. Uh, being an orphan in the uh, hiding, in hiding I changed my name, I, not me, but uh, one changed my name, my identity. I mean, I was, dis I disappeared as uh, uh, Pavel, or Paul mm -hmm. in French, Paul uh, Friedlander, I became Paul Henri Marie. So disappeared as a Ferland. Jew. Mm. Disappeared as a Jew. Disappeared as a Jew, of yeah. course. Yeah. But disappeared as, a, as, as a, a, a child with a name. Yeah. Uh, and, and one should add, of course, that disappearing as a Jew was the secret to survival. It was the only way. Yes. And uh, the astonishing thing, in, uh, not in that part of the story, but in the 
surrounding part is that the French police went to look for me. Yes. Because they had lists. They had arrested my parents on the Swiss border. I mean, the Swiss arrested them, sent them back to the French police. And if you have seen those big uh, registers, the French had all the names of those Jews deported from France. So, and it's alphabetical. So I find my parents in November uh, of 42, and then I find them in the Auschwitz, Auschwitz books uh, in December of 42. But um, the French, by writing all this down, also knew that there was a third member of the family. Yeah. And so the police uh, went to the place where we lived. Luckily, nobody knew where I was. Yeah. So uh, they didn't get me, but that shows you the atmosphere. So if you ask what is memorable, uh, what I didn't know at the time and knew yeah. only later, forms one yeah. single story. So what is memorable about when, uh, where memory leads? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, my intention, I had there uh, a clear intention, uh, was to tell how somebody totally traumatized, mm -hmm. because I was, although I, uh, this is another question, didn't necessarily show it in any immediate way. Uh, could live ultimately a normal life. Mm -hmm. so, and it goes over years and years. And to give an example, um, at some stage uh, in, in the early 60s, after having worked for the government and so on of Israel uh, in various uh, functions, I decided to get back to graduate studies. I had been an undergraduate in Paris at the political science school uh, and worked at the Israeli embassy to make a, a living. And then went to Sweden, strangely enough, not far away, and spoke Swedish even for, a, I, I spent a year in Sweden, uh, working with uh, children who were uh, handicapped in an art anthroposophical institution. My uncle, who had escaped from Prague to Stockholm, was an anthroposoph and uh, took care of that institution. And I spent a year with the uh, small barn, and the uh, barn being uh, children in yes. Swedish, you know that. They know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, and then I, I got some money and continued to Harvard, where I, I stayed only a semester. And then worked, worked, worked years for different institutions. And then came back to studies in, early, in the early 60s. So all that looks pretty, I mean, somebody who knows how to take care of himself, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, competent, But yeah. all that was on the surface. Yeah. And at some stage, um, I mean, as I say it in the book, I can say it here, I started suffering from terrible anxiety uh, attacks uh, without any uh, apparent reason. And then from psychosoma, you know, I lost uh, uh, equilibrium and things like that, never mind. And took, from that time on, took uh, medication to stay more or less, and I take it to this day, yeah. and of course cannot get off it. No, that so, um, so you see, the normal say is a superficial thing. One cannot get off those. Uh, so some people never talk about it. I mean, I, I say it somewhere, I said it in a lecture, yeah. I don't know where. Some people disappeared after the war, those who survived, as Jews completely. I had colleagues in Geneva, where I then taught, uh, who were Jewish. Mm. I knew it after many years, 
and of course they were not. They were uh, mm -hmm. uh, wh whoever was called Kurtz was cousin, yes. <laughs> which is a yeah. choice <laughs> which I admire. Um, uh, so that, that's one group, a small group, but a group. Then the second group didn't deny Jewishness or whatever, but never talked about the war, mm -hmm. neither to the children nor to anybody else. Yeah. And the third group cannot stop talking, like me. <laughs> uh, and but that's a minority, uh, right? What? That's a minority? No, but uh, it's uh, equal to the others, let's say. You saw it in uh, Los Angeles, the 1939 yeah. club, mm -hmm. which are people who first, I mean, the Jews after the war were absolutely silent, not among themselves, but to the outer society, because nobody wanted to hear about anything. And secondly, you don't want to look like a victim. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. if you come to the United States, which yeah some of them, or quite a few did, from the DP camps, uh, arrived in uh, wherever, New York, Los Angeles, you don't want the society around to consider you as a victim. How yeah. will you then uh, thrive, you see? Yeah. But once they became relatively well off in their midlife, mm -hmm. they started talking. And of course, there was a r ridiculous kind of coincidence that NBC, uh, uh, brought out, uh, screened its uh, very bad series, mini-series, Holocaust, which changed, strangely enough, changed. I mean, people in Germany uh, who saw it then twice, on Channel 4, I think, in Germany. It, uh, we, 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 the third channel, yeah. We never, or whatever, it yeah. was CDF or no? It's I, it was IRD, but it, IRD, was, it was in yeah. the third channel of Europe, uh, the third, third channel, channel of the regional Because channel. I was there for the second kind of uh, yeah. screening. 1982. Uh, people, yeah. Mm -hmm. People said, uh, was ist das? We have yeah. nie davon gehört. Uh, I, which is pretty ridiculous, uh, <laughs> of yes. course, because uh, Oma and Opa, uh, in a way, knew very well. Well, in, 19, in 1979, when that was broadcast, sometimes we even talking about the parents, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, certainly yeah. the grandparents, sometimes yeah. also the parents. So but, do, but do you think, you know, that's well known, right? The television series from 78, 79, and we talked about this. But don't you think the Eichmann trial already changed? Uh, no, in Israel, yes, a lot. Well. I mean, Israel is a very strange case for, for all this. When I arrived in Israel, I was never bothered. Uh, I came alone, of course, on a ship which was attacked and by the Israeli newly formed army yes. because it belonged to the extreme right, yes. to what would today be the Likud. I had no idea, I just got on the ship. And uh, it was shot at and 16 people were killed on yes. the ship. But that's uh, local history. But in Israel, people didn't like, although there were 200,000 or something uh, escapees from Europe, mm -hmm. uh, that is displaced person who made it after the war and mm -hmm. from Cyprus from, from uh, Europe to Cyprus and because the British sent people back to Cyprus, then to Palestine, Israel. Uh, and notwithstanding that fact, the official stance was, we don't want to hear about this story. Yep. We want to hear about the ghetto fighting. Yes, the heroes. But not about the heroes, yeah. but not about the, what was called like a human dust. Yes. Ben Gurion used the word yeah. human dust. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the passivity of the Jews going back, going to their deaths like sheep to slaughter, that was an expression invented uh, by right. some Jewish. Uh, yeah. And that lasted until the Eichmann trial in 61. Yeah when the witnesses and the, the massive uh, aspect of the trial gave large audience on the radio, right? Mm -hmm. All of Israel listened. Yeah, no the television yet. Was no radio. television in yeah. Israel until 68. Uh, 
yeah. uh, gave them the sense that that being in Europe was not just human dust, that you couldn't do much when you uh, were, uh, I don't know, when you, your weight was uh, 40 kilos or something yeah. like that. Well, uh, the Eichmann trial was a turning point in Israel, but not in, not in Europe. Yeah, that's true. Although it was widely reported. Mm -hmm. Then came the Auschwitz trials, mm -hmm. a few very shortly afterwards, in Frankfurt. 1963. Yeah, the two Auschwitz trials. Mm -hmm. It had a lot of reactions on the spot, and then again disappeared. Uh, disappeared. Yeah. It is really that silly uh, NBC miniseries that changed, I don't know why, well, generational change, yeah. uh, in part. I mean, uh, as but a, as you a, go ahead, as you do the, as he, the as memory <laughs> as a study, is not me. Yes, indeed. I, I, as a television expert, I should, so to speak, as a footnote, I would venture to argue that the production actually wasn't that bad. That it is still a very, that it was a very well, good, good production. Good actors, but Hollywood. Good actors and Hollywood, but Hollywood is also ent good entertainment, uh, capturing, yeah, uh, okay. and, and, and uh, good aesthetics. Uh, that, that's the difference between yeah. history and memory. Historically, a catastrophe, but in terms of memory activation. Yeah, I and absolutely and, and agree. I mean, event. it was a bombshell. It was a bombshell. And that changed, that was a game changer. Yeah. But maybe to, to, come, to come back to the, to the text, I wonder if, if be because you have, you, have su you talk about the question of coping, right? Uh, writing as coping. And we have now talked about memorability in terms of what the audience might get out of it, which is a lot in terms of also memory politics, but what about the more personal aspect of, of coping? With yes, uh, if, I, if I might dare, because uh, it, seems, it seems also, uh, 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 well, it, it takes you quite personal if you read a good memoir, uh, and your memoirs are written in a very personal way. I think that's also a reason why they are so, so, such a page turners, because it feels like you're speaking to the reader personally. Uh, and you let us, uh, uh, you know, you let us uh, yeah. look in, inside your feelings, your thoughts, your life, your embarrassments, yeah. your, your sicknesses, uh, your despair, <laughs> quite directly and, 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 and radically. And, you know, I, I very much appreciate that. Uh, and and I'm inv I feel invited to, to raise the question uh, in how far a memoir, two memoirs, um, serve the purpose of coping for you personally. And I want to add to the question uh, to other very prominent um, uh, memoirs of Holocaust historians who, uh, for me at least, I knew their work, I knew your work before I knew your personal story, which adds to the dramatic effect these memoirs have, have had on me as a reader. Uh, and I'm speaking of uh, Raoul Hilberg's uh, memoir, The Politics uh, of Memory, Memory, in the 90s. I guess the first Ruth one. Lüge. Yeah, this one, but she's, well, if you count yeah. historians like, uh, of your standing, Raoul Hilbeck probably was the first one, and Otto Dov Kulker's astounding uh, Erinnerungsbuch, huh? he has a special term for it, uh, Metropol in der Landschaft des Todes is the German yeah. title. Um, I read it in German and I was stunned because yeah. I, n I had no idea that Otto Dov Kulker, as an eight-year-old boy, was in Auschwitz, actually. Mm -hmm. And he kept sort of a diary and recorded audio tapes uh, with uh, you know pieces of his not even memories but images metaphors landscapes that are you know he visualized in his head and in all three cases it's it's it wouldn't do justice to any of those works to to, to mix them and i don't want you to um, uh, to comment too much on the other two but um, i wonder you know there are three men who made it their profession uh, to to study the holocaust object or scientifically from an from an disciplined point of view uh, with certain methods and you have to justify what you do and why you do it. Um, so what is, the, what is the function for you personally of those two memoirs? How, how do the two compare? And what's the purpose um, with an eye on the, on the audiences you, you try to speak to with both memoirs? What do they add uh, to I, I the I don't know about Hilberg, although I knew him quite well. Uh, but I was no, not close enough for him to tell me why he wrote the politics of memory. I knew, I know Dov uh, Kulka very well, and I actually, if I may say, 
encouraged him, as he says at the end of his book, mm -hmm. uh, to publish his diaries, mm -hmm. uh, which I had read. I mean, he showed parts of it to me. And I said, you should absolutely publish that. And that gave him maybe one of the... But I think for the three of us and for many others, there are, as you know, hundreds of mm -hmm. memoirs published and non not published. The need to tell, it was a need, as you know, during the war. And many, many diaries were killed uh, in the process of writing the diaries, uh, did it to re record events which were un unimaginable to them. And uh, for many, it, it remained a puzzle, to put it mildly. So that first, I think the, the need to write was a need to witness even many years later, writing memoirs, or writing uh, or transcribing diaries or whatever. <coughs> uh, but I can really speak <laughs> mainly of what uh, I needed to write and not, I didn't calculate any, any effect of it and I didn't know what would uh, come out of it, but could not find the right voice. That is, I wrote, and I, as I say in the second memoir, I brought my memoir to my publisher, who was a good friend in the meantime, Paul Flamand, in Paris. It was written in French. And he said, yeah, but it's dead. There is no feeling. So I suggested a dialogue with Claude Lanzmann, who accepted, that's before. He became unbearable. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, that then I thought this is not the right way. And I was, I, I thought I would drop it. And then by pure chance, I got in touch with somebody who was with me in the Catholic uh, boarding school, the seminary, and who was a monk. Uh, a Trappist monk. Mm. Uh, you say Trappist? Uh, well, yeah. it's one of the Catholic orders yes. in, uh, in the Loire uh, region. And I, he even, although they are not allowed to talk, he got a special permission and invited me to come and visit him for a day or two, which I did. And we talked about everything, and he's, he died a few years ago. I can just say he was there and didn't believe in God. Mm -hmm. uh, for a Trappist, rather difficult, uh, he told me that. So yes. I said, so why are you here? Yeah. He said, what else should I do? I have learned nothing. I have learned theology, yeah. and that's uh, what will I do outside? It was a very, it's, if you look for tragic stories, this yeah. is really tragic to be in a, a Trappist monk and not believing in what you would be the reason for being yeah. well. And uh, when I came back to Geneva, I suddenly it occurred to me that I had never explained to him what happened before I came in. We talked about the place where we both were in uh, the boarding school and not uh, I knew a little bit of his history but he didn't know a thing about my s so I started writing him a letter and the letter addressed to somebody who who, who in a way <laughs> was in my world mm -hmm. gave me the voice did you once send I had the voice I could write did you send the letters the letter never Never. No, no, no. I didn't send the letter. I then wrote the book. And you sent him the book? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right. Of course. So in that sense, but, but did the writing make a difference for you personally in terms of, did you have a sense uh, of Was catharsis? it a relief? Yeah, Was it some form of relief no. or no. Uh, coping? That's a question which is asked. Yeah. Did it, yeah. did you find liberate? Yeah. Uh, no. 
Nisa, uh, the one or the other, but the other, I mean, at my age. Yeah. But uh, no, uh, I thought it would. But then I discovered that nothing has really changed. I just told the story. It had some echo, but um, for me, it was all the same. And may I, may I interject and ask, uh, was, uh, I actually, I, I, I misphrased uh, my question. I actually, I, what I thought, uh, you describe in your first memoir how you kind of, like a detective, search for the truth, as you search for what happened to your parents. And I, I meant to ask, was it kind of um, giving you some sort of closure to really finally find out what was the reason why they couldn't return, why they uh, couldn't uh, escape, uh, when, you, when, you know, when you discovered in 77 that they were turned uh, uh, back at the, at, the, at the border because they didn't have a child. Was that some sort of, of course, there was a, does no, there was a shock, but I also a closure? because I knew that uh, for many years mm -hmm. I had received for various, from various people after the war the letters that my parents sent from 39 on to various friends and also the last letter of my father thrown out from the train. So, um, uh, he says, by mistake, we are in train taking us to Germany. He was in the train taking him from a French camp in the south of France to Dancy, mm -hmm. uh, near Paris, which was the assembly camp uh, for the Jews from where transport then went to Auschwitz, always with 1,000 Jews in each in order to keep the, uh, the count easy. Uh, so he, in that uh, letter, he says, well, take care of the child, don't abandon him. But uh, I knew, uh, I knew, of course, from all that, where they had been arrested and so on. Now, to show you the, the resistance to memory, mm -hmm. in the second volume, mm -hmm. I, I tell the incredible fact that uh, arrived in Geneva in, six, in 61 or two to st for the doctoral studies. It took me, and the place where my parents had been arrested was saint jean Golf, on the French coast, French-Swiss, on the other side of Geneva, let's say, of the lake. And I knew perfectly well that they had been arrested there, but 17 years, I didn't, I, I had a car, I, I could have gone and seen the place, most catastrophic place in my life, yep. didn't go. And uh, not that I wanted uh, not to go, it never occurred to me to go, which shows repression of a very strange kind, but that shows you how difficult it is to get through these various uh, closures. Yeah, yeah. And ultimately I went, when I had the idea of writing the book and started, I thought I must go and see. And that really, well, the change probably came without my noticing. Well, that's the, the, the Trappist monk is a perfect transition to a <laughs> question, the question of religion, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's so difficult to be in such an esteemed uh, company, both uh, Wolf and uh, Tina and you, of course. <laughs> uh, and I was just sitting here listening also to what you said, and you uh, you mentioned the TV series, and I felt like I wanted to add this, that, and I don't know whether you told your students, mm -hmm. uh, when when the TV series, uh, uh, the Holocaust, the Holocaust, the, the story of family vice, right. yep. uh, was to be broadcast in Denmark. Mm -hmm the Danish uh, broadcast company, and by that time there was only one TV channel, which is of course difficult for you to imagine these days, but I remember I was 14 and 15, and I know my friend over here, Peter, he probably remembers it too. Uh, originally they actually rejected to, to mm -hmm. uh, show it on, uh, on national television in Denmark because... They refused? Yes. It, it was considered too much Hollywood soap, and that is actually the wording. Uh, because you mm -hmm. could not treat uh, uh, history and such a serious history. And, and now we are back in late 1970s in, in, uh, in this kind of Hollywood way. 
First of all, they were not speaking Polish. They were not speaking in the original languages. They were speaking American, of course. <laughs> and that was considered really, no, you mm. don't deal with history this very uh, popular way, and which I think is a, is mm. a big change. Uh, uh, uh. And I must say also one thing for me, being 14 by the time, it made a huge impression on so me. So where watching did you see it? Here, eventually, because then, because of there was then, followed a debate in national uh, uh, newspapers mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the Jewish community also intervened and eventually then they actually broadcasted it uh, in, in Denmark on national uh, television. You may be, maybe you remember and somebody else here, some of your colleagues you remember maybe yeah. too. Uh, so there was that kind of a small footnote. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and also the Trappist monk is of course a, a nice uh, uh, transition to, to my question about uh, religion. You uh, uh, being Jewish, uh, and then Catholic, and then Catholic, and then kind of what you describe is a kind of pendulum uh, work, a kind of commuting between having a Jewish background and then being brought up uh, Catholic, and never really feel allays or, or or relaxed in any uh, of these religions, uh, and I was very um, emotional taken by what you just described now, the letter uh, from your parents and how they actually give you to this Catholic uh, seminar and how they also give up uh, religion and the sacrifice they make. And maybe I think it would be, uh, if you could tell this story and of, of this sacrifice they make. Comment on that. Yeah. Well, if I may say, in this whole tragedy, the lucky side re regarding this is that we came, well, I was, I came, but my f family was totally assimilated. Mm -hmm. uh, not uh, Non-Jewish Jews, like mm -hmm. uh, Isaac Deutscher wrote once the title of a book, famous book, mm -hmm. Non-Jewish Jews, he spoke mm -hmm. of Isaiah Berlin and so on. Yep. And um, I saw for my father, this I should mention, my father was asked by the people in charge of the seminary to write a letter that is to promise that I would be baptized, which was obvious, and that I would be educated in a, the Catholic religion after the war. So as, as he was totally non-religious and wanted to save me, he signed without any problem. But uh, imagine a strictly orthodox Jew. Mm. It would have been at least a huge dilemma. Yes. Well, in my case, that was not the dilemma, but my uh, moving f from the Catholicism back to, I never ba uh, moved back to the Jewish religion. I back, moved back to a Jewish identity, which in, was first national and then cultural, whatever you want to call it, but nothing to do with religion. And I, I must, in all this, tell a somewhat comical story. Uh, I got a formund, how do you call that? What? A formund. A oh, good question. No, somebody uh, yeah, who... Yeah, taking. No, uh, like the Godfather. I got a yeah, kind quite, of Godfather, yes. uh, not in the religious sense, but uh, after the war, I had uh, nobody. So because, my because you were a minor. Uh, yeah, I yeah. was a minor. Yeah. I was yeah. uh, 15, uh, 14, or yeah. when I got yeah. out, yeah. or thirteen, and, uh, and so my and uncle the word is a legal guardian. I think a legal guardian. That's yeah. it. A yeah. guardian, yeah. but he was just in place of my uncles who were two of them in Palestine and one in Sweden. Mm -hmm. That's how I came to Sweden. Uh, and uh, so I had a very Jewish uh, guardian, religious and everything, who invited me to come to the fer first seder mm -hmm. of my life, which is the dinner uh, where Passover begins, mm -hmm. seder. So he lived in Paris already, so I took the train to Paris. And uh, the Seder 
there were many guests, of course, because the event also might, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, being saved from the, like Moses from the Nihilus. <laughs> <laughs> and here I was, and uh, so they started eating, praying, and then eating soup, which was okay. But then came the meat. Mm -hmm. I said, <laughs> don't eat meat. They said, are you ill or something? <laughs> I said, no, but it's Good Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Karfreitag. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. had the house <laughs> collapsed, <laughs> they, would have, <laughs> they would have considered it more normal than <laughs> this Jewish kid saying it's a Karfreitag. <laughs> as a can, that makes can flash. Sense. Okay. Can flash yes. So it shows that there were uh, Ich pendelte in German. I, I moved from, but then I abandoned, I became a communist for three months. And, uh, <laughs> well, because so, so they asked me to sell the humanité on the yes. street. Yes. Acheter l'humain. Yeah. But I, I couldn't, I was yeah. too shy too for shy that. that. So once I discovered I had no talent to sell the humanité, I decided so that, that the party was not for me. So. Yep. <laughs> And then I became a Zionist. And yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> no, no. But I, I just wanted to maybe uh, add another question because how then did you become aware of your Jewish background? Not, you know, no. the, what you just described. Uh, thanks so. to, a, to a Catholic priest. Yes, I should say that. Uh, when the war ended and uh, it became apparent to the nuns that one day whether they want it or not, maybe I should get back to that point uh, in a moment, um, I will be out. So they wanted to reinforce my faith, mm -hmm. which at that time was very strong. And they sent me to visit a, a priest who had come from time to time, a Jesuit priest, to, to preach or to, uh, to say mass mm -hmm. in our place, uh, Loriggiola, he was an Italian. Of, uh, in, he lived in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of community of Jesuits in Saint-Étienne, which is an industrial town in the east of France. Mm -hmm. So I went there and we, we wandered through the city and he said to me, uh, didn't your parents die in Auschwitz. I said, Auschwitz? What's that? Wow. I knew they were dead, but I never heard of Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. So he explained that uh, at length all that he knew. I was, sh I'm sure to this day he died many years ago, that he wanted me to be conscious of my Jewish roots. Mm -hmm. He wanted to push me back in a way, Why? out of charity, okay. I'm sure, out yeah. of a sense of justice. Yeah. So he, he told me about Auschwitz, I understood very well, and when I came back, I asked the nuns to give me back my name, Paul, Paul uh, Friedlander, mm. Friedlander in French, mm. uh, but uh, not to be anymore called Paul-Henri Marie Ferland. Mm -hmm. And that is thanks to that priest. So you see, the world is very, <laughs> uh, in the post-war world and the war world, not, uh, not speak of that, but the immediate post-war was very chaotic psychologically. Mm -hmm. And this priest, this Jesuit priest, made it sure that at least I would know where I am and from where uh, things come. So, so then from Catholicism to, to cultural Judaism? Cultural, but really just getting back in my original identity, then uh, but not religion. Then a very short, uh, brief communist interlude? Three months. Mm -hmm. Three and months. then, and this is of course the big question. But I, I did, uh, I did uh, go to demonstrations against the Marshall Plan. Oh. <laughs> and the war in, <laughs> well, no, the war in Korea came later. Came later, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then Zionism? Yeah, Zionism. Uh, I became a, a fervent Zionist 
uh, in my gymnasium in Paris. I was a boarder, of course, in uh, the uh, Lycée Henri IV, which is a good, very good high school. Um, and uh, read some three, four newspapers every day and saw what was happening in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Because once the United Nations decided on the partition of Palestine in November of 47, uh, the war started. I mean, uh, between the Palestinians, in a way, the Arabs living in Palestine, and the Jewish community. And I followed that uh, and felt, of course, very much identifying with the Jewish community. So I wanted, I was part of a movement called uh, Habonim, the Builders, uh, socialist, mm -hmm. Zionist, but Jews. And uh, when I said I would like to, to go to, to Palestine to fight, they told me, you are too young. Mm -hmm. So I consulted a friend who was a very right-wing kind of, mm -hmm. uh, like Likud today, but beyond. Yes. He said, very easy, change your age and, and go to the right-wing yeah. Betar, yeah. which is the right-wing, was at the time. Because they take any they, No, I added two years to my age oh, yeah. by changing on the, You can do that. <laughs> if you have your ID and take a chemical product called Corrector, you can mm. change the whatever into whatever. Mm -hmm. So I did that and went to the headquarters of the Beitar at the Avenue de l'Opera. And they asked me, what do we want? But I knew what to answer. <laughs> I said, both shores of the Jordan. I had no idea oh. really where the Jordan River was, <laughs> but uh, I said, both shores. <laughs> they said, fine. <laughs> and, um, and that is how they called me then to join them when, the, when we were supposed to take, uh, to get on the ship in Marseille. I joined them in, at the railway station in Paris to Marseille. And, and arrived in Palestine. Raises interesting question if that's still the question of faith in the Likud today. No. But that <laughs> raises the question about... Uh, about Israel, of yes, course. Yes, I think it uh, does. Yes, uh, it's in Where a way... It? Please have a sip yeah. of water. Or Do you want or some water? Yeah. Yeah, I have the water. I see it. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good enough? <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> No, I think it, in a way it's inevitable to uh, not uh, well um, to ask the to the ask this qu question also because um, in your first book uh, you you start to write about uh, when you arrive uh, Israel and also your first kind of encounter with Israel and um, like many you you arrive with a, a certain amount of um, enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, and I have read several also of uh, similar um, uh, uh, memoirs or, or reportages or whatever from uh, Danish Jews visiting Israel during the 1930s, being extremely enthusiastic. But then I also note in your book uh, that uh, you start uh, to become a bit disenchanted. I, know, I note a certain disenchantment with Israel uh, and uh, maybe I should just read a small passage, if I may. Uh, uh, and this, of course, this is written in when? 1977? 90 yeah, yes, let's say 77. 77, because it came out in French, I just checked, 1978, in English, 1979. Uh, so here I read from your uh, uh, first book, um, memo memory book. Um, I was proud of Tel Aviv as though I had erected it myself. I hastened to see its most recent building and was entranced by the strong pulsations of an urban life that in reality was simply those of an average city in the Middle East. I could feel the power of the effort being expended every day and the dimensions of the success achieved. Sometimes, however, the dirty uh, peeling facades, the decrepit look of buildings only recently constructed the glaring, naive, bad taste of the store display uh, windows, the absence of any conception of city planning, and above all, the noisy vulgarity of the people. 
got the upper hand and even at this early point in my life aroused in me a feeling of malaise. French word. A brief and limited one, it is true, but one that nonetheless went beyond simple aesthetic sensibility and somewhere awakened in me profound misgivings that perhaps went to the very heart of things. And maybe I missed something, but I, could you explain this misgiving that went to the very heart of things? And what things? What was uh, the feeling of malaise? Why? And do you that's still have what that? You are asking. Yes, what that's my question. And what I at the time didn't really clearly answer, although I say at the, if I remember correctly, I say at the end of the book that uh, I doubt that the state of Israel will uh, last mm -hmm. uh, and that it will be an episode in the life of the Jewish people and so on. So I had already my uh, doubts, uh, not about lasting of Israel actually, but about something uh, bothered me. Not really uh, the peace process, because at that time uh, Sadat had come to, to Israel. Mm -hmm. There was a real sense that peace was on the way. I mean, it was just I mentioned it, by the way, the Sadat mm -hmm. uh, visit to the, and the, pre the Egyptian president. And um, so there was hope, but uh, the malaise was about the whole society. I, I, I didn't feel at ease. I felt at ease in French culture, but it was more a cultural matter than a political one. And um, after all, I then continued to teach until uh, I uh, retired from Tel Aviv uh, in 97 or something, and then taught only in Los Angeles, but I had taught in both places for many years. So I, I stuck to it, but with greater and greater feeling that a, I didn't really belong, but that was my personal going uh, in all directions, you know. Uh, and then being really uh, more and more with time, uh, uh, very worried about the political direction, mainly after Rabin's uh, assassination, uh, 95, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So uh, to the cultural kind of malaise uh, added then the political uh, uh, doubts and which are today very strong. But uh, let me be very open also that all this is not, uh, I will try to explain it. Today you have in, on American campuses maybe more than here, no, not more than in Scandinavian countries, but on American campuses, you have a strong anti-Israeli, strong anti-Israeli organizations, mm -hmm. BDS and so on. I, I mean, you know probably about it, which are uh, organized by the by Palestinians, by black students. I mean, the coalition of those who are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, the Palestinians belong to it. And uh, there is a real hatred mm -hmm. of Israel, which is expanding. It's not something which... And that's where I, I, could, I draw the line, you see. Mm -hmm. I am extremely critical yeah. of the Israeli policy. And I write about it from time to time, or I speak about it. But I don't so much like to do it outside of the country. Mm -hmm. I would prefer in a way to be able to, to be in Israel and, and say it all the time. But that's the fact of life. I live in the States and I feel very much uh, alienated from the policies that I see. But you see this anti-Israeli position of, the, of those movements I just mm -hmm. mentioned turns very quickly into the negation of the right of Israel to exist. Yeah. 
And for me, that is the line I would draw. I'm critical, I'm extremely critical. I'm ready to say it everywhere, here and wherever. But I think that Israel has the right to exist, mm -hmm. that it is in any case a presence which will not be wiped out very easily. And uh, uh, then, let me say, there is a third stage in this movement, critique, I agree, uh, negation of the existence, I disagree, and this turns very easily to anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. which of course I disagree. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, one has to understand the differences and the nuances in the position. Uh, some of my friends, colleagues, Israelis, have become so bitter that they are even ready to, for, uh, to let the state disappear. Mm -hmm. yes. That's not me. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I was intrigued now by your answer about the word malaise because you said, yeah. uh, first and foremost, that this was a kind of cultural alienation. At the beginning, yeah. And that made me think about, there's a similar passage uh, in Where Memory Leads, where you speak about America. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds very similar. It's also <laughs> where you said you were never, never home, you, you, yeah. you never felt part of that. But then, you know, it's an, it's an obvious question also, the obvious question to the migrant, um, did you feel at home in Geneva? No. Did you ever feel at home in no. a place? And that is the point. That's the point, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, can, I can live anywhere, yeah. even in Denmark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. It's uh, not that bad. My, my <laughs> wife, who unfortunately is not here because she tours Aarhus, uh, and finds it much more interesting than to hearing me saying more or less the same thing, <laughs> um, uh, told me, ah, that is where we would like to live. Well, so I will tell almost. her that this is impossible. <laughs> uh, will you explain that to me? But uh, in any case, I mean, I, I really have, if you ask me, where is your home? Yeah. Uh, I would say, Nowhere, but also everywhere. Mm -hmm. That is, I, I adapt very easily. Mm -hmm. I adapt linguistically, I adapt mm -hmm. culturally. Um, I adapt, and, but that's typical of the permanent mm -hmm. migrant, let's say, not immigrant, yeah. because I never went to a place where I mm -hmm. stayed. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles, I mean, you understand, you have lived there many years, that one can feel malaise Mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. It's tristesse. Not, uh, I think the word is tristesse uh, you use in the second uh, memoir. That's true. Tristesse. What did you say? Tristesse is the word you use in the second memoir. Ah, yeah. uh, did you I say yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, not malaise. Mm -hmm. That was uh, in the first yeah. one. In the second one, Los Angeles is tristesse. Yeah, but it's the same. Nicely described. Well, I, I yeah. can yeah. sympathize with the lack of history and culture that you seem to feel there. But it's interesting yeah. that Geneva doesn't, or France doesn't do the trick. Well, no, France, uh, because my culture is French. Yeah, exactly. And That's why. Um, there I feel at home culturally. Yeah. Mm, language. Uh, but yeah. I cannot feel at home culturally in Lo neither in Los Angeles nor... Uh, but that's Not in Israel. But really. that's precisely why I thought it's so interesting. If it's a cultural malaise, one would expect that Paris would do the trick, at least temporarily. Yeah, but how can, can one live in Paris, tell me? Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, with more no. money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these are all uh, secondary matters, really. Should we go back to, to the writing and maybe... Uh, scope, a little bit wider scope and, and take into consideration also historiography and not just memoir. Yeah, well, I, uh, uh, maybe I can uh, go quickly back to our, our um, exchange about how you um, research the fate of your family and then try to make a loop um, to, to your magnum opus, um, opus magnum. Uh, uh, and there's one, one thing I, I would like you to clarify. When did you find out that, uh, not that your parents <coughs> hadn't survived the war, but when exactly did you find out that the fact that they didn't have you with them cost them uh, their survival? When did you find out that they were misinformed and that the precise fact that uh, uh -huh. they didn't have you with them 
that was this astounding uh, discovery in that book for me that you yeah. found that out. I think you didn't know that until 77. Yeah, well, Did you? Uh, that's going back to the Swiss border. Yeah. <laughs> My parents uh, made a series of rational but totally false decisions. But that was, that was the case. If you, uh, I mean, it, it was all a matter of luck mm -hmm. uh, or of uh, a lack of luck. But mm -hmm. nobody could figure out exactly what to do. Yep. And my parents were convinced that uh, passage from France to Switzerland over the Alps, although there were ways of going in not high mountain, but still, um, was too dangerous for a child. And in any case, this was a dangerous enterprise. And mm -hmm. they thought I, they would get to Switzerland according to the information they had from friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would come later either during the war with a false passport or after the war. In any case, I would be safe and they would reach possibly safety. Okay. Now they, uh, they were arrested uh, by pure chance also because the whole group of 15 Jews uh, in that case walked in that place, Saint-Jean-Golf, mm -hmm. during at three o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and there was no, no guard uh, on, on the Swiss side and not on the French side, so you could just walk. There's only one street goes mm -hmm. going along the lake. Yes. And uh, some youngsters came out of a bar and saw the group, so they called the police. Yeah. And the police arrived, the Swiss police, and uh, arrested the whole group. And that week, the couples with children were left through. The couples without children were sent back. There were two of them in that group of 15, my parents and another couple. Had I been there, we would have been in Switzerland. Uh, and that's, uh, that shows you, uh, if I may add, one small detail uh, which I wanted to add before and did not. After the war, my guardian mm -hmm. was told where I was by my uncle in Sweden. And okay. so he came to the place mm -hmm. and asked for me to take me out. And the head nun said, there is no child uh, youngster with that name. Well. So he was very puzzled and uh, probably phoned and was told, no, no, he's there. So he came a second time and she said, no, never heard of a name like that. So he had the idea to go to the district headquarters, mm -hmm. to the prefet, to the prefecture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they said, okay, if they say a third time, we sent the police mm -hmm. to search the place to see if there is somebody. And when he told the third time and showed a letter from the prefet that the police would come, they let me go. Now, why? Why nuns who had been basically protective, even mm -hmm. if it was to save a, a, a young convert? Why? Because the Pope, Pius XII, Mm -hmm. uh, and that I knew, I know for, for 15 years now, mm -hmm. that I didn't know when I ro uh, wrote the book on Pius XII, gave the instruction at the end of the war that Jewish children who had been baptized, sacrament, uh, and were in Catholic institutions should not be given back if their parents mm -hmm. didn't come. Right. Jewish children who hadn't been baptized, but were in hidden in Catholic institutions, should not be given back even uh, if their parents didn't come back. Only those children whose parents, or mm -hmm. real parents, came to ask for them should be given back. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is a matter of doctrine, I guess, mm -hmm. but it was also a kind of basic 
I don't know, lack of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, but that I, all that I didn't know when I wrote on the yeah. Pope. Uh, this was found out in, by a French researcher in the, he, he found a letter written from the Vatican to all the nuncios in the various European countries. And they then gave the instructions to the bishops who gave the instructions to heads of institutions. Yeah. So, but uh, maybe go back to historiography. Well, yeah. there's a, there's yeah. a, if I, if I m may be allowed to speculate a little bit or to probe you on what the significance of that dramatic moment, uh, you know, when, when I read it, this, this realization that your own hi being and hiding uh, did guarantee that your parents did not survive and that your whole existence is kind of burdened by that, uh, by that realization, seems like an unfathomable uh, fate. Uh, and there must be a sense of disbelief. And this is a, a key word, a key concept in your, in, your, in your work on Nazi Germany and the Jews. And I wonder whether, there, whether you can elaborate on, on the possible connection between that very personal, disbelieving, heart-wrenching story and your conceptual innovation, uh, which, with which you started in the first volume, um, which set out to alter, as you said at the beginning, the way Holocaust historians narrate, uh, the, narrate the Holocaust. To create, and I want to elaborate a little bit on, uh, on that because may maybe not all of you have read it, um, uh, you, you say it in the introduction to the first volume, you say uh, you want to write an integrated uh, Holocaust history. Uh, you are searching for a unison mode of engagement with your readers to convey a fractured yet coherent atmosphere of the time during which Nazi Germany sought to murder all the Jews of Europe and to transcend, even repudiate, the convention, uh, conventions of historical narration thus mm -hmm. far. You claim that thus far, consciously or not, historians had neglected, avoided, suppressed their sense of disbelief, your word, vis-a-vis -vis the unprecedented monstrosity of the crimes they encountered while researching history. And that the Holocaust on the whole, uh, and, and thus they paid an, un an acceptable price for the promise of synthesis, yo, so you say, I'm paraphrasing, namely the domestication of the Holocaust on the whole, as well as of their individual ethics, right? And then you, you move on and you argue that uh, giving uh, the victims a voice by quoting diaries, and maybe we, can, we, we will have a chance to talk about the death of the eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, we all feel, mm -hmm. and the relevance of diaries for the future of Holocaust memory. But the way you give voice to, to uh, the victims by quoting uh, the, the, those, those documents, those diaries, most of them not even published. Um, um, you know, I wonder whether, and, and you, you certainly succeed in taking, gripping the reader, you know, and uh, you know, again and again, we, we share the feeling of disbelief. And there's a big argument in Holocaust studies, uh, you know, can we explain something if we claim it's not to be believed? Um, maybe we can leave that discussion aside, but I wonder whether you can elaborate if there's a, if there's a connection, if it ever occurred to you that, that, that this inspired you to uh, choose the, the approach you've chosen in Nazi Germany and the Jews. Well, it's more, if I may go a little bit beyond the question, the, of course the question is at the center, uh, why did I write those books. It didn't, I didn't have this uh, intention in the early 80s or in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, the incident which uh, <coughs> led me to, to that project, which took me 16 years to accomplish, uh, was my debate with Martin Brochard. Now, if your students will not know who no. Brochard is. Martin Brochat <coughs> was one of the two major historians in the Bundesrepublik, that is in West Germany, uh, of Nazism. Uh, Hans Mommsen was the other one and uh, Brochat, I would say, mm -hmm. they were the two most important voices. Mm -hmm. uh, Mommsen uh, remained a good friend to almost the end of his life. Brochat, from the beginning, was hostile. Uh, now it comes out that he was hostile to Jewish historians, 
in general. But in my case, I felt it already at, uh, at the first international <coughs> conference which took on the Holocaust, which took place in Germany, in Stuttgart in 1984, yes. uh, where uh, Brochat um, uh, said, well, the Israelis think that, uh, that he wanted to say the Jews, but of course <laughs> not <laughs> to say the Jews, he said the Israelis. So I, 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 and in the meantime, historians of that, all that have, of mm. course, said the same thing. Yes, that's true. Uh, uh, so I, I felt uneasy with Brochat and about him. Then he wrote a famous article, which maybe your students will read at some stage, Ein Plädoyer für die Historisierung des yeah. Nationalsozialismus. A plea, a plea for, plea the, for the historicization. Yeah of National Socialists, where he attacks, by the way, at the very beginning, uh, the miniseries Holocaust, yes. saying uh, Hollywood, da, da, da. and he said, we have to stop with this moralistic attitude and going two steps back when we speak mm. of the extermination of the Jews, we have to historize and to consider it as part of, Jew uh, of German history Nas the National Socialist period is, should not be uh, in a way uh, put in parenthesis. It is part of normal mm -hmm. history. His idea being that the Nazi part was the elite and the German people, uh, the Volksgemeinschaft in a way, lived underneath a normal life, mm -hmm. normal uh, with the difficulties of the war and so on, mm -hmm. but was not touched by propaganda or by Nazi slogans. They lived a normal life. Uh, if you want to give a, a um, pictural example of this, you will go back to the film we saw together mm -hmm. and other students of the seminar, uh, Heimat, mm -hmm. Edgar yeah. Reitz. Heimat, yeah. The Heimat series has the same idea, at mm -hmm. a little bit before Brochard. Yes. Uh, 84, I think, or 83. Yeah. Uh, remarkable series, by the way. Yes. Um, mm. So, Brochat wrote that, didn't mention the word Auschwitz or final solution or anything in his article, uh, Historisierung. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't mention this, but I wrote an article criticizing him. So he got pretty upset. Mm. How did this Jewish kind of nobody uh, dare to criticize me? He wrote to me, I have a whole correspondence with him, mm. telling me, we will, you criticize me, you criticize. So let us have an exchange of letters, uh, three letters each, and, uh, and let's do it fast. He imagined that the head of the Institute for uh, Contemporary History in Munich, that was the position, he had tens of assistants. Uh, Norbert Frey was one of them, uh, whom we mentioned at the beginning, I think. Um, and in any case, he knew that uh, I didn't have any organization, so that but mm -hmm. he made a crucial mistake in his first letter to me. Mm -hmm. He started and I would finish. He wrote to me at the end of his letter, first letter, of course, the victims, that is us, have a memory of the events mm. and this memory should be respected. It can even show us some things. Mm -hmm. But it is a mythical memory, a mm. mythical mm. Gedächtnis. Yeah, mythical memory. Yeah. A mythical memory, which is a, a gross obstacle mm -hmm. to German histo rational historiography. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> that was something not easy to swallow, that we, the victims, uh, had a kind of imaginary vision of the past, mm -hmm that the critical German historiography was rational. So I uh, had to answer, and I answered, don't you think, I mean, you c accuse us of a subjectivity that cannot be 
-hmm. rational and cannot allow us to write the history of the Third Reich. Don't you think that somebody like you, who was in the Hitler Youth, I didn't know he had been a member of the party. That was, became known only after his death. Uh, but have been in the Hitler Youth, educated in Nazi Germany. You don't have a mm -hmm. subjective burden on your shoulders. So, so you the tone went up, but uh, <laughs> this settled the matter, actually. So we should, in fact, be very thankful because your answer is two big books uh, to that, uh, in essence. Well, because then you gave, books gave a push, are uh, certainly gave a push. Yeah. Yeah. It was intended yeah. to answer the brochure accusation that we, the Jews, were unable to write the history. Mm -hmm. um, and I had been accused of that uh, in lectures and so from time to time, how mm -hmm. can you, and that's a question which surely should be addressed in historiography, being part of uh, the events, being a victim of the events, can you write a detached history? Mm -hmm. Not easy to answer, but that's another question. So that was the origin of the project. Now, I didn't immediately think of the voices of the, the victims as a kind of equilibrium. Of course, I, I remembered Brochat and what he said, but it was not my intention. I had written an article before that, much before, on um, working through uh, for the historian of the Holocaust, how does one work through uh, one's experience and the material? And I had said, well, by not closing, by no, not reaching closure, by leaving things open. So I thought of that when I started writing. And, but I, in the article, I said, we should interrupt the narration by comments from the historian, each mm -hmm. time interrupting the narration. And then I thought, this is not good. It's a little bit like Goldhagen shouting the mm -hmm. poor Jews. And so. Yeah, and so it occurred to me that the way of cutting <laughs> the narrative was to introduce the voices of the victims, because they wrote their diaries in the events and expressed their, you know, more than astonishment, their, we can not understand, incomprehension mm -hmm. to what was happening around them. And they were the interruptions. So I thought first of the voices of the victims as interrupting the narrative in a kind of postmodern historiography. Mm -hmm. And then it occurred to me that it went much beyond that, that one had all the time written from the, uh, from the perspective of the perpetrators. And this was a completely uh, non-equilibrium, <laughs> how can you say, non-balanced, unbalanced historiography. And that uh, actually the, the victims uh, had as much to say on what was going on in their own way of not comprehending it and of making all kinds of, of, uh, of building hypotheses of what could happen, what was happening, which they didn't understand, which explained to me, and that's the historiographical importance of, that the, the victims, by being the last, really, to understand and probably never understanding what was going on until they were uh, pushed into a gas chamber or being uh, killed in an open air uh, killing site in uh, Eastern Poland or Russia. Um, uh, even then, maybe they don't, didn't understand. In any case, uh, by, by being ununderstanding and believing that even when they were being deported from Warsaw to, the, to Treblinka, they were going to a work camp. You see that in, uh, in diaries. They were, that is one explanation of their passivity. The mm -hmm. famous passivity of the victims, which made it so much easier 
is explained by the fact that they had no understanding. And here I would like to give an example of a diary which I couldn't include because I, it was not published when I wrote the, the second book. It was published afterwards by the, f the family allowed the publication. It is the diary of a French woman called Hélène Baer. Mm -hmm. Very rich family, very high class uh, person. Hélène Baer, a young, not a, a youngish lady uh, in her 20s probably, uh, studying uh, for a doctorate at the Sorbonne expelled from the Sorbonne, of course, and then going ultimately to work in the only Jewish hospital with, which existed in Paris. Uh, and in 1940, at the end of 1943, that is well into the exterminations and well into the, into the rumors which spread throughout Europe that the Jews were being exterminated, she writes, I more or less remember it by heart. Yesterday they came and took 40 of my patients. One which is paralyzed of the face. One, a woman who is about to give birth. And she goes on citing some of those who were uh, practically dying. And she says, these people send them to work? This is crazy, they will die in the transports, but how could they work? That is this Helen Bear, which was so educated. Her doctorate was on American literature. Uh, so intelligent in her whole uh, writings. When it comes to taking her patients to manifestly what was killing them, uh, people were <laughs> more or less dying. Uh, and she says, uh, send them to work, this is crazy. I mean, they will mm -hmm. buy, die on the way. Uh, shows you the complete, complete incomprehension. Yep. Which was, of course, a need. Uh, you don't want to see your death. You push it back. It's, I sometimes say it's like with terminal patients. I had a very close friend whom you knew, Amos Fugenstein, yep. a very great scholar. Uh, who uh, moved from UCLA to Berkeley and uh, got cancer. Uh, uh, lung cancer and it was pretty bad. And uh, he uh, became, he was aware that this was something that had not a chance. So I would come from Los Angeles to San Francisco to Berkeley and he would explain to me that, um, he would say, oh, you know, it's very bad. And he told me about the chemotherapy and everything. Then he said, well, you know, next semester, mm. I would really like to teach this and this seminar. So on the one hand, mm. he said, oh, it's bad. Uh, but then he, he clung to the idea mm -hmm. that he will teach this and that Six months later, of course, he died within weeks. Mm. But uh, it's a little bit that need to cling, you know, yep. to some rumor, to yep. some belief that, yes, it is, uh, um, it will be OK, so we will work. And, and some will die, but some will not. So, so in that sense, the, uh, the disbelief, the origin of the the point of origin of the disbelief is, in fact, the perception uh, of the victims. Yes. That then, be, that then uh, be has um, a structural equivalent in the years of extermination. The structure yeah. being you write the history yeah. on the one side from the perpetrators and you, yeah. you destabilize. Yeah. Yes, you destabilize that story with, uh, with giving the voices of the victim Indeed. as much uh, weight. Now that brings me to an intriguing uh, trajectory. So first I, I, I find that, so, so we find now, if we follow Tina's analysis of uh, when memory comes, so there seems to be in the memoir, in the first memoir, when memory comes on the one hand, 
And in the second volume, especially in the second volume of uh, the years of extermination, there seems to be at times a parallel construction. Uh, there seems to be at times a parallel trauma construction, for example, in terms of this, the, the intersecting of different narrations of different levels of time also. Because what, is what makes uh, When Memory Comes such an interesting, intriguing memoir, a complicated one, is that it works on three different time levels. Yeah. And it creates even some kind of a time ambivalence where man doesn't exactly know when did this happen, right? Yeah. Man can go into some details. So, so I would say that there is, so to speak, a trauma structure at work on in both in terms of the years of extermination and then in, uh, in When Memory Comes. So that's, that's a point of departure, perhaps. Now, what is so intriguing is that the second memoir, of course, does not work in terms no. of trauma structure. It works chronological. Yeah. It is extremely. It is gripping. It is. It is. It is a page turner as well. But it doesn't work. It doesn't have trauma structure written into its uh, into its very fabric. Now, does that mean that? in 50, 60 years, we'll also normalize historiography <coughs> again? We'll yeah. Do we return to a non-traumatic structure of writing the history of the Holocaust in, uh, it in could another be. generation? It could be. Yeah. It could be because, A, and that's really not so important, but you mentioned it, it's the end of the era of the witness. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, you see one of the last, <laughs> no, not of the last, but uh, in a few years, I won't be able to, to give you the, except, of course, uh, if uh, um, you believe <laughs> in spirits. Well. But um, uh, so that is a turning point, I think, in terms yeah. of, uh, of um, historiography. Uh, secondly, there is by necessity a need of, of uh, historizierung of normalization. Okay. Uh, you can't avoid it. The sense of unfassbar uh, uh, un incomprehension, incomprehensibility yeah. yes. cannot stay. I mean, time, time erodes this kind of uh, this kind of feeling which belongs to a generation or to Yes. the generations very close to events. But uh, it can take some time, but necessarily, I think, it will become, it will be flattened. Yeah. It will become a history, like which, anything. Which, which I think raises very important questions about future politics of memory. <laughs> uh, how do we? Kind of, yeah. Yes, I, 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 you know, why, why do I we do what we do? I kind of followed your lead. Yes, <laughs> you did. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, so now I bring you back to contemporary yeah. times. Of course. Uh, and and uh, and perhaps also contemporary politics. Not yeah. only the politics of memory, but maybe also contemporary politics. We talked about uh, victims and um, how important their testimonies uh, became for writing a different uh, uh, history of uh, the crimes of National Socialism, you mentioned, and, and also Tina kind of brought that in. Uh, and of course, uh, when we talk about memory, uh, uh, victims and survivors of, not victims, but survivors of the Holocaust have been extremely important for uh, uh, maintaining, uh, not only maintaining, but also sharing the memory of, uh, or their memories of the Holocaust with uh, next generation, second generation, and third generation, actually now. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, we are now in Denmark, we are in Europe, and most, um, countries in Europe have actually decided to keep alive the memory of the Holocaust. Uh, that is decided on a political level uh, uh, and every year we commemorate uh, victims of the Holocaust and other genocides here in Denmark on the 27th of January. Uh, it is the, uh, uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, yeah, also yeah. decided by the UN. And you, <laughs> you, we talked about the Eichmann trial 
Uh, I would add here the importance of actually trials for having testimonies included in writing the history uh, of the Holocaust, that that is also a very important component because here yeah. you have uh, survivors... In the Eichmann trial it was uh, vital. Ex exactly. Uh, uh, but since the, the Eichmann trial and up during the 1970s, the, the TV series The Holocaust uh, was e extremely important. Uh, and then up during the 1990s, where you had several uh, states apologizing or admitting their <coughs> share of responsibility here in Europe, that the crimes of national socialism were not only to be blamed uh, on uh, Germany, uh, but also that France has uh, its <coughs> responsibility, Belgium, uh, 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 yeah, Switzerland, Eastern Austria, Europe. Eastern Europe, and that came later on, uh, uh, and even Denmark. Maybe you don't know that. Right. Even then, Mike apologized mm -hmm. uh, in 2005, I think it was. Now I'm actually, my memory oh. is a little <laughs> loose here, uh, uh, which may, consider, may be a little bit odd considering the very nice history of a Danish um, Holocaust experience with the rescue in 1943. So, long introduction for this question. How do you feel about this political keeping alive uh, the memory uh, of the Holocaust imperative? Is it right by states uh, to do that? How do you feel about that as I a survivor? I don't feel well about it, but uh, that's my own, uh, you know, I don't like museums uh, of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I have uh, seen uh, two or three of them Yad Vashem, of course, in Jerusalem, because I worked there in, uh, for my dissertation at the beginning, and then came back many times. So Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, I went once to have a look. And, then. and uh, in Los Angeles, there are three museums. I never went to any of them. Uh, in general, in I Berlin? avoid. May I ask? In Berlin, did you go and see the Did you go and see the Holocaust in Memorial in Berlin? In Berlin, I uh, well, I see of course the, and the, uh, the ort, stones. The ort but, beneath. Yeah. Did you but go and beneath inside? Beneath, there is something I didn't know. A research mm. center. There's an ein Ort der Information. Ein Ort der Four Information. Rooms. No, I never. Yes. I didn't know it existed. Well, uh, so that shows you something. That's my mistake. Though. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's. Uh, <laughs> <and> <laughs> And, uh, well, I didn't know what can I yeah, do. My fault, I said. <laughs> Why? You should have... Uh, I should have pointed it out when we had a discussion with Peter Eisenman in Los Angeles. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, that's that, true. yeah, that yeah. was a long time ago. Uh, 2012. That's not a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, and in Paris, I went once to the Memorial de la Deportation, but that's enough for me. I, I don't like it because, of course, I carry my own memories and I have taught and mm. so. So I know the, every little detail, I mean, I mean uh, that I, uh, one person can know. Uh, and, um, uh, but it's, a, I don't <laughs> like the idea of governments imposing memory. Mm. What is that? Memories should be, co should come naturally from a community or should disappear, but governments <coughs> imposing memory for the sake of uh, uh, political correctness, uh, I don't like it. But it's a purely subjective uh, reaction and I'm sure most people would say this is very good. Which, yes, absolutely. Can we yeah. extend the question, if you allow me to extend the question and include not only the, the politics of the state, but what it to, to maybe, maybe counter your, your response with, with, with your own statements in a book that uh, uh, Wolf just published, mm. Probing mm. the Ethics of Holocaust Representation, where an interview, a conversation with you is printed, where you say, where you kind of um, make, a, make a statement for a civic engagement in keeping the lessons of the Holocaust alive. The very, the very last answer to the question, you know, so what is the future of Holocaust memory 
what is it that we actually take away at the beginning of the 21st century? And you say, for you, the Holocaust is a calling for a particular attunement to the suffering of others. It should not lead to nationalist policies, which you've also demonstrated impressively today, but inspire an inclusive transnational global human ethics. Yes. yes. So how does this go together? It goes. Because you can't do that without some form of state's responsible involvement. It should, it should come naturally. I mean, uh, you can have state decisions uh, to commemorate this or that, let's say in Israel, it won't change the feeling that, or the, the, the collective pressure mm -hmm. to change the policy towards the Palestinians, although it's not on the same level of, uh, but it, it would be linked to that. Um, look, I mean, uh, Raoul Hilberg made this very sad, Last, wrote this very sad last sentence about Rwanda. He uh, mm -hmm. heard of the Rwanda um, genocide and said ultimately nothing has changed, which would not have been his attitude, let's say, a few years beforehand. Mm -hmm. But basically, one should maybe use that memory uh, in order to change attitudes, as I said, globally. But one cannot impose it. It should come from teaching, from, from the need of everybody, and not imposed by because it doesn't help. Doesn't uh, okay. It doesn't help. It, if it's not a, a memory which is naturally kept uh, by this or that mean, be it films or whatever, uh, but kept from generation to generation, at least for the three generations, uh, then uh, nothing will help. Uh, the state imposing it uh, doesn't, to me, doesn't make much sense. It's not contradictory, but it's, I don't say the state should impose. It should come I agree, I agree. From the bottom. Yeah, but it's <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It raises very interesting questions about how, how this kind of imposing can or cannot be efficient. One could, for example, suggest that, the, that we just talked on the way over here about uh, two European countries accepting refugees in the so-called recent refugee crisis, right? That was uh, Sweden and Germany. And one could argue in the case of, maybe in the case of both countries, that they fail, that one of the factors that plays a role in that what in Germany surely is is a question of of an of an state sponsored holocaust memory and it's also it's stockholm right that was the place where holocaust memory was so to speak enshrined as a yeah. as a western memory and that and then one could argue that maybe maybe it does work uh, on occasions uh, it worked in germany because of let's say the the, the feeling, not the obligation at a, a purely abstract level, but the feeling, I think, of Merkel yes. and others that it was part of a kind of national responsibility, yes. which uh, von Weizsäcker yep. in his famous speech on May yes. 8th, yep. uh, 1985, expressed so strongly. Yep. And that I think remains in the minds of people, even if they don't know the exact mm. details. So I, in Germany, certainly, but in Sweden, I don't know. But otherwise, look at what happens in Poland, in Hungary, in, and so on. Just the contrary. Yeah, but one could, of course, argue that Poland and Hungary are the places which haven't had much of a state-sponsored Holocaust memory, a very ambivalent one in Poland. As <laughs> very as ambivalent. So in that sense, you know, in some places with a, wh where Holocaust memory has a certain tradition already, like it has in Germany, it actually helps to, to craft generations with a certain sense, despite the fact that many of these institutions and many of these dispects are one, many of these texts that are involved are one-dimensional and somewhat problematic, they might have an effect. Maybe. Maybe. We'll yeah. see. I, wanna, I, I want to, uh, you, you don't even know what great measure of respect you receive here because Danish students normally need a break after and an that's hour. That's what I was trying <laughs> to And they are, they are to still, I mean, I not that I 
need the, the interruption, but I was wondering, students would have rebelled in any other place. Yeah, but they do, they do here too. This is because you are here. Uh, well, yeah, this is, this is no, a good... Uh, this that is, is really a little bit too much. I mean... <laughs> well, <to> maybe. <laughs> maybe. But I, in that sense, I want to promise that we are, that we are going to wine and, and food in a minute. But uh, I want to... Very brief questions. One last of them. Last question. Last three questions. Oh. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> but you can. But you can answer. I will answer very briefly. Exactly. <laughs> One of them you can answer yes or no. Do you keep a diary? No. So you you never, don't have never did never did good, yes. which makes it all the more remarkable to write a memoir so many years afterwards. Then another question. You are a, an avid reader always read. You know, I think you say at some point in uh, where memory leads, you say, I still read, what else should I yeah, do? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> is there a memoir you really like? A memoir? A memoir by another person you really like. A memoir that maybe also at some point maybe indirectly inspired you. No, not uh, in terms of being inspired, but I like memoirs actually. And I read one which is a pseudo memoir. I mean, it's a memoir, but with added uh, uh, fictionalized event. But basically, it's a it's a memoir, and that Proust's remembrance yes, of uh, things. Past. Yes, of course, <laughs> not <laughs> a bad memoir. Yes, but although most people wouldn't call it a memoir. Well, it, it is. But yeah. uh, there is a narrator, but uh, yeah. so that's a fictional part. That's but true. basically, it's an autobiography. I'm really wondering about how how Proust scholarship. They might disagree with you as much as Kafka, Kafka scholars yeah. did when yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> published the book. Uh, by the way, could I just inject a, a remark of uh, really a, the most amusing remark, not about Proust but Kafka, because you just yes. remind me of Kafka. I received an email a week ago yeah. from a person saying, oh, I have seen you are a specialist, which I am not, of Kafka. Yeah. Well, I am the great niece or something of the Kafka family. Yeah. And I want to tell you that all members of the family thought he was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yet answer because I was <laughs> pondering what should I answer to <laughs> no, that's, a, yeah, that's a fantastic story. That's, like, that's fantastic. And then my final question. My final question is about, you said it, you, you're not at home anywhere. You are, mm -hmm. a, in that sense, a permanent migrant. Yeah. How, does, how does changing your, your country of residence, not your Heimat, your country of residence, how does changing your language how does it, has it changed, has it informed your perspective on these events? And just as an illustration, I want to, so to speak, highlight that you wrote the years of extermination in what, I, if I calculate correctly, this is your fifth language? Your fourth, your fifth, your fourth or yeah, fifth language? Yeah, once I knew Swedish, but I forgot it completely. <laughs> so it's four and a half languages. <laughs> yeah. so, you, so you decide in to write your book, and also you wrote, of course, that's also, I think, quite remarkable, right? You wrote uh, Where Memory Leads in, in English. English. Yeah. And, the, and, and the two volumes in English. In English. So, so yeah. has something changed? Uh, where, where, whereas the first one, of course, was written in French. And you also say in Where Memory Leads, you still claim you, are, you have a French identity, cultural, as you said. And I would, so to speak, somewhat provocatively say, but if I look at the structure of Where Memory Leads and I look at the way that you, with the directness with uh, that you address even difficult topics, it seems to me in for the better and for the worse, but uh, even mostly for the better. It seems to me like a very American book. That's what you say. That's what I, I say. I never, n I, when you said it uh, a day or two ago, I was wondering: is that an insult or is, <laughs> that, <laughs> is that a compliment? <laughs> I, I, well, I, so I kept. Quite, so maybe I can it's ask you the last question. Yeah. Yes. What do you mean when you say it's American? Okay, good. I can, <laughs> I, can, I, can, I, can, I can demonstrate it by way of an object also, even a, a passage from the book. I don't know if I have it. I can, I'll get it. And that, that will be promised our last point then for today. Uh, where is it? Um, there are a couple of moments where I feel it's American. Where do I feel? I feel it's uh, I in its honesty, you know, where people, where you talk about, as you did here, you know, you said very clearly, I have been taking uh, psychopharmaca for, for, for a long part of my life. I'm, I use them every day. 
uh, that's, that has a directness and a disarming honesty that, that I, from my experience, uh, connect, for example, with American culture. And then I also feel that the book, and again, I think this is very good news, if, if When Memory Comes is a book about trauma, I have a f often the feeling this is a book about post-trauma. It's a book about, because you end the book saying, for example, and this, uh, this I should I try to End quote. the book uh, we're talking about our dog. For example, yes. You end the book with a dog and the section on the picture has a dog. So I, I think this is, this for me is a very much the kind of gesture of American life I know. But there's another. Let me quote, let me, f let me read one quote um, because I think it is very, it is very revealing. But there's two different ones and I have to, tr I read it in German so I have to translate it now. You say here, the consequences of the Shoah has determined my life trajectory, Lebensweg. Yeah? But now, by now, it is only impacting, it is not, is, is no longer impacting my everyday life, right? My everyday life is as gray and sunny as that of many of my contemporaries, which is very different from how you begin the book. Because at the beginning of where memory leads, now you're not talking about where memory comes, you say, um, people like myself who have experienced their childhood under catastrophic conditions may appear normal at the outside, They're, but this is a facade. Uh, in, their deepest, in the deepest core of their personality, they will always carry a wound. And out of this wound, Uh, develops a strange dynamic. One cannot get rid of this wound and one, one tries in order to compensate uh, to, to erect a very functional outer appearance, this kind of facade, but that doesn't help. And uh, it only has the consequence that one tries over many years harder and harder uh, to create this kind of facade but one is still uh, full of anxiety. The feeling, becomes, the feeling of anxiety comes a little blunter maybe with times, but it has always accompanied you throughout your life. And I'm just saying this because these two parts, at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, they seem to indicate a kind of trajectory, maybe even a trajectory that was the result of writing uh, the second. Maybe. 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 Good. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> yes. <laughs>